Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. The so-called two sessions concluded on Sunday. We did not see much change in terms of policy, and of course, General Secretary Xi Jinping remains the top man. But there were some important personnel changes and a few policy announcements, and we should take a few moments at least to cover some of this now. The four vice premiers. Five state councillors and the secretary general of the state council have all changed. However, only two of the state council's 26 ministries and commissions, the Ministry of National Defence and the National Development Reform Commission, saw new heads appointed. Critically, the governor of the central bank, Yi Gang, and the finance minister, Liu Kun, both stayed in their positions. This is important to note because, as we have discussed in previous videos, we should expect a lot of movement in financial regulation over the near term. As Beijing wrestles with financial and fiscal systemic challenges, indeed, Chinese financial media outlet Tai Sin reports today that a regulatory restructuring will establish the National Financial Regulatory Administration to replace the China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission. The new regulator, the outlet writes, will assume all oversight of financial services except for the securities industry, which is to remain under the China Securities Regulatory Commission. The new authority will also take over day. Today, supervision of financial holding companies from the People's Bank of China, the central bank. It also appears that this central regulator will take some of the duties from local financial regulators across the provinces. A sign of greater centralization. The outlet also points out that of the 13 major changes approved by the Congress during this two sessions period, six of these involve financial regulators. Which is very telling of Beijing's priorities. Meanwhile, after a long career as an administrator and economic czar, Premier Li Keqiang has stepped down. His replacement is Li Qiang, a pick, as we discussed last year, which has divided analysts and commentators. We will need to follow his performance over the next 12 to 18 months to get a sense of how he will be in the top economic role. On Sunday, Li gave his first speech as premier. The themes are familiar to what we have seen since the Central Economic Work Conference last year, which laid out China's economic plan for 2023. Quote. On stability, the emphasis will be placed on ensuring stable growth, employment, and prices. And the key to seeking progress lies in making new advancement in high-quality development. Last year, there were some inappropriate discussions about private enterprises. They're referring to comments about socialization, which made them feel frustrated. The private sector will enjoy a better environment and broader space for development. End quote. And of course, Xi Jinping ended the National People's Congress, the second of the two sessions, with a speech. There were no real surprises in the General Secretary's comments, however. Quote, Xi's speech was significantly shorter than the ones he gave the first two times he became president. Unsurprisingly, the themes do not diverge from what came out of the 20th Party Congress. He mentions common prosperity, as well as better integrating development and security, and the need to ensure a new development pattern with a new security pattern, and to build the People's Army into a great wall of steel that effectively safeguards national sovereignty, security, and development interests. End quote. Taiwan was also identified as central to China's so-called goal of national rejuvenation. Next up, several key developments on the military and geopolitical front. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to hit that like button. And as always, anyone who can go that extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, I rely primarily on subscriber support to keep the channel going. Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Over the last few days, several U.S. and European media outlets are discussing unconfirmed reports that General Secretary Xi Jinping will be traveling to Russia to speak to Vladimir Putin as soon as next week, and may even speak to Zelensky for the first time since the Ukraine war broke out. China has some leverage over Russia, as its only major friend left in a hostile world. 
and it also has a deeply important strategic interest in winning back support from the Europeans. With that in mind, she could try to achieve some sort of breakthrough on the peace front, or at the very least, signal to the Europeans that he is trying. Coming hot off the heels of supporting the restoration of Iranian-Saudi diplomatic ties, which we discussed in yesterday's video, any sort of breakthrough with the Ukraine war would certainly be another big diplomatic win, and be real fuel for Beijing's narrative wars with the US. Though we are certainly getting ahead of ourselves with a lot of these very big ifs here, we shouldn't count our chickens before they are laid, let alone hatched. For now, we just have unconfirmed reports of a Xi trip. We will see how it unfolds as it happens. The US-based Wall Street Journal writes, citing unnamed sources, that she is expected to visit Moscow next week to meet with Vladimir Putin. A virtual meeting with Zelensky is expected to take place during the trip too. She is considering visiting other European countries, according to the unnamed sources, as part of his trip as well, though this is also not confirmed. Next up, yesterday, Monday, the leaders of the US, UK and Australia unveiled new details of their plan to create a fleet of next-generation nuclear-powered submarines, a strong sign of increasing Anglophone collaboration in geo-military competition with China within Asia. According to the announcement, largely as anticipated, Australia will purchase up to five conventionally armed nuclear-powered US submarines starting early in the 2030s, followed a decade later by production of a new class of SSN AUKUS nuclear-powered submarines developed with US and UK technology. In a separate statement, the White House explained that the sale of the US Virginia-class submarines will avoid a so-called credibility gap between the time its Collins-class diesel-electric subs are retired in the 2030s and the new SSN in AUKUS vessels come online 10 years later. Officials from all three nations stress that the new alliance is a response to an increasingly provocative Beijing, especially across the Taiwan Strait, not a conspiracy to contain the nation. Of course, Beijing likely doesn't see it that way, having called the alliance a menace to international peace, driven by Cold War mentality, to use its words. US officials push back against this. Quote, Our goal is to deter, because competition does not mean conflict. Still, we must have the combat credibility to win if we must fight. End quote. State-run Global Times called the alliance a gang of Anglo-Saxon brothers set up to attack China, adding in the same article, in a somewhat contradictory manner, that Australia was being used as a tool of Washington. For its part, on Sunday, Britain announced a defence spending increase of six billion US dollars over two years to be used, according to a statement from the Prime Minister's office, to replenish ammunition stocks, modernise the UK's nuclear submarine programme, and fund the next phase of AUKUS. On Monday, the UK unveiled an integrated defence and diplomacy review, which included key policy on China. UK's Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has also expressed that he wants to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. The first phase of the AUKUS alliance is now underway. The US and UK nuclear-powered submarines will visit Australia regularly, preparing the host ports for their own subs in the future. Virginia-class subs will be purchased from the early 2030s, the first British-built SSN AUKUS ships will be introduced late 2030s, and then Australian-built vessels by the early 2040s. According to Australian media, the deal could cost up to 183 billion US dollars and would push Australia's defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. Some analysts pointing at this military build-up, military build-up in Asia and build-up within China itself, believe that we are simply witnessing a traditional arms race trap. Quote, Each step that the US takes with allies to bolster defense and deterrence is described by Washington as a response to a China challenge and by Beijing as yet another move to contain and encircle China. The net effect of Monday's AUKUS announcement may well be to ensure China's military can get generous funding for its own submarine and anti-sub warfare programs. 
end quote. Several key Asian states, including Japan, are also greatly increasing their military spending out of concern for Beijing and in response to the Russian war in Ukraine, which in turn Chinese policymakers have pointed to to justify more military spending themselves. We remember last week, Beijing announced its largest defense spending increase for 2023 in half a decade, at a rate much faster than projected GDP growth. The just quoted analyst added another observation that folds into our second story for today, as well as the theme of Chinese diplomatic efforts. Quote, for China, drawing European powers like the UK deeper into Asia's security mix may be even more disturbing than the prospect of Australia acquiring nuclear-powered submarines. Beijing will add the AUKUS announcement to a list of offences that already includes American military aid to Ukraine and Taiwan. They will paint a sharp contrast between US weapon sales and China's diplomatic success in brokering an agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful day wherever you are, and I will see you all tomorrow.